This footage was recorded on August 15, 1945, that intoxicating night in Chongqing following the announcement of Japan's surrender when many Chinese allowed themselves to express the laughter and tears that they had been suppressing for eight years. Amongst this crowd of revelers was a star student of the Chongqing National Academy of the Arts named Duan Wenjie. A majority of Chongqing's refugee population trickled out of the city, eager to return to their homes. Contrarily, the Sichuan native Duan Wenjie bade farewell to his newlywed wife and followed the exodus out of the city. He followed them to the northwest towards the city of Dunhuang. There, he hoped to come face to face with mysticism and art. I wasn't alone in my journey. There were many others. For instance, Zhang Dachuan set off very early, and he stayed there for a very long time, and many, many people went there. Duan Wenjie traveled for a full month before arriving at Lanzhou, where he heard of the closing of the Dunhuang Art Institute. While in Lanzhou, he met with the director of the institute, Chang Shu Hong, who told him that for the sake of reviving the institute, Chang Shu Hong was returning to Chongqing. Because he was unsure of how long it would take, he bade Duan Wenjie to not wait for his return. In the winter of 1946, the residents of Lanzhou often saw a young man selling water at street corners. This youth was Duan Wenjie. He stayed in the city for an entire year, certain of Chung Shu Hong's return. This winter, his waiting finally paid off, and a tearful reunion between the two was had as Chung returned with news of the Institute's revival. At home, he could touch the blue sky when he reached out and see the windswept mountains at a glance. From that moment on, Duan Wenjie never left Dunhuang, never stopped drawing. He became the inheritor of Chong Shu Hong's legacy, the master hidden in the desert. Uh, all of my paintings are my favorites. I love them all, especially the ones where I was right up against the cave wall. I felt so special to be right there. Ever since Mr. Chong set up the institute, all the workers had to be artists. Why is that the case? Because they came to study ancient artist techniques. And to do that, they first had to copy the art itself. At the time, the entire Dunhuang Institute consisted of less than 20 people. Their most important work was copying the art. The majority of artists who arrived around the same time as Zhuan Wenjie were also from Sichuan. Compared to the foggy and humid Sichuan climate, their greatest impression of Dunhuang was its scorching sun. When Ouyang Lin got there, he was only 23. Such a beautiful sky. After the sun rose, the only things over our heads was the blue sky and the sun. It wasn't an ordinary shade of blue either. There was an old worker who grew melons. They were very sweet, very tasty. Our meals weren't anything to write home about, but those melons were amazing. Just as the desert climate is said to have dehydrated these fresh-faced artists and the lack of dietary variety presented its problems, their work of copying frescoes eliminated any lingering feelings of loneliness and isolation. Once I entered a cave, my spirit immediately lifted. There was always something new to see. I wanted to see everything. I just had to. These beautiful works of art took the young artists into their own little world. Once they started working, all of their worries evaporated. Since the Dunhuang Institute began their large-scale copying of Dunhuang's murals up until the beginning of 1948, 
Over 800 murals had been replicated by their hands. We mostly copied the small ones, short scenes, a fairy tale here, a bodhisattva here, a boost of bodhisattva over there. We copied images uh, like that. The process of copying was research in and of itself. In 1943, Cheng Shu Hong led a group of 12 volunteers of people, such as Gong Sheng Li, Dong Shi Wen, and Zheng Lin Ying to Dunhuang, founding the Dunhuang Art Institute. In 1946, eight more volunteers, including Duan Wen Jie, Guo Shi Qing, and Shen Fu Wen joined them. In 1948, Zhou Xingyi funded his own expedition to copy Dunhuang's murals, while Shi Wei Xiang came from Sichuan to Dunhuang. In 1950, the National Dunhuang Art Institute was renamed Dunhuang Cultural Relics Research Institute. Group after group of young men came to Dunhuang, breathing new life into the city and bringing renewed hope for its traditions. I feel that the majesty of Dunhuang's art is apparent no matter the circumstances. It's as simple as that. What exactly are Dunhuang's painted grottos? For modern man who takes pleasure in seeking knowledge, it is natural to ask the following question. What is the source of this work of art? Additionally, what drew those artists to this location one after the other and kept them there? April 8th of the lunar calendar is recognized as the birthday of the founder of Buddhism, Sakyamuni. Many Dunhuang residents, following the tradition of their ancestors, spend the day praying in the Mogao Caves or nearby Buddhist temples on this Buddhist holiday. It is the busiest day in the year for the Mogao Caves. The city of Dunhuang boasts many adherents of Buddhism as its history and culture has deep ties with the faith. As Buddhism spread from India into China via the Gansu Corridor, Dunhuang was one of the most important stops on the Silk Road. All in all, nearly 2,000 years have passed since this ancient city was first baptized into the Buddhist faith. Dunhuang holds the unique position of being one of the first Chinese cities to come in contact with Buddhism. The faith quickly took root in Dunhuang and played a major role in the development of its system of painted grottos. Since the construction of the first cave temple in 366 AD by Abbot Le Zun, by the time of the Tang Dynasty this number had expanded to over 1,000 caves of all sizes filled with murals and painted sculptures. Every era needs its defining work, but where do you find it? At that time, artwork was usually found within places of worship and in the past, you painted on part of a temple. This is why the beautiful grottos at Dunhuang are so special. You see, we're so lucky it still exists. The awe that the frescoes and sculptures that make up this so-called magnum opus of its era brought to visitors can be seen in this excerpt from the recollection of Langdon Warner, who gained notoriety for stealing specimens from Dunhuang's frescoes. The unfathomability and expressiveness of the bodhisattvas led me to realize for the first time why I journeyed halfway around the world to ascertain their existence. Their exceptional beauty could not be analyzed by my well-trained eyes. I am not a Buddhist, but at the same time I felt like I was baptized into the faith all the same.
Ever since the library cave's discovery in 1900, Dunhuang has captured the world's attention. People were hard pressed to find another location which held such a trove of knowledge dating to an unfathomable bygone era and attracted scholars to itself in an endless stream like moths to a flame. Today, Duan Wenjie is already a venerable 90 years old. His clearest memories remain those caves and the paintings that he copied within them. His life can be separated into two periods. The first half was spent focusing on copying Dunhuang's frescoes, while the latter half was spent using those results to perform research. The rules he laid out for fresco copying were to reproduce the original appearance, maintain the original spirit, and to maintain the same quality of craftsmanship as the original. His copy of Painting of the Governor's Wife Venerating Buddha displays this attention to detail. On September 22, 2007, in celebration of his 90th birthday, Duan Wenjie opened an art exhibit where he made a public appearance while showcasing his own work. That copy of Painting of the Governor's Wife Venerating Buddha was displayed in Tokyo next to more than a hundred of its siblings made by Duan and his colleagues in 1958. This is the first time that the Dunhuang frescoes appeared on Japanese soil. Since then, Buddhist pilgrims have come to Dunhuang from Japan in an endless stream. Famed artist Hirayama Okuo, the chairman of the Sino-Japanese Friendship Association famously said, the quintessence of Japanese culture is preserved in Dunhuang. It is its homeland. This is the National Library of China located in Beijing. These English fellows are currently teaching workers here how to use computer technology to restore Dunhuang's ancient manuscripts. We're from London. She's a photographer. She's going to show you how to digitize the scrolls, and we will show you the entire process. Uh, let's begin. In recent years, efforts have been made to unify the disparate collections of these manuscripts located in countries like Britain, China, France, and Russia, giving birth to the International Dunhuang Project. Using cutting-edge technology, member nations have digitized their collections of manuscripts and created a unified database, facilitating cooperation in any research efforts. These documents inside the National Library of China come from the Library Cave of Dunhuang. At the dawning of the 20th century, a door in history was opened by a person of little renown. Wang Yan Lu's chance discovery led to a priceless treasure trove being revealed to the world. He had no idea of the impact his little discovery would have upon the world and its history. Inside one of Beijing's hutongs in 1909, a group of Chinese scholars led by Luo Zhenyu frantically transcribed the artifacts taken from Dunhuang by Paul Pelio. As proud Chinese, the act of transcribing scripture rightfully belonging to China was an act that brought much sadness to their hearts. The most valuable examples of the Dunhuang manuscripts were lost to foreign powers. Development of research of Dunhuang in China has mostly turned into revolving around Chinese scholars' process of searching for artifacts overseas. November 10, 2007. Zhejiang Province's city of Haining, the hometown of famed scholar Wang Guowei, was celebrating the legacy of his contribution to the study of Chinese culture and history. In the 1920s, Wang Guowei's fate was closely tied with that of the Dunhuang manuscripts. 
Wang's teacher, Luo Jin Yu, wrote the article Book List of Dunhuang and the Discovery on the second day of his copying. This was the first time when he introduced the discovery and precious treasure of Dunhuang to the Chinese. During the winter of 1911, shortly after the incitement of Sun Yat-sen's revolution, Wang Guowei and Luo Jin Yu headed east to Japan, staying in Tokyo for eight years. They shut themselves off to everything but academics, burying themselves entirely in researching the Dunhuang manuscripts and oracle bones. This all happened after 1912. During this period, they came to Kyoto with him and cooperated more closely with Kyoto's faculty. This period was the start of internationalized Dunhuang studies. In the 60s and 70s, in the winter of 1978, during the third plenary session of the 11th Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, China came up to a road of reform and opening up policy. Spring had finally arrived for Chinese Dunhuang studies. In 1981, Deng Xiaoping inspected the grottos of Dunhuang and inquired after the Dunhuang Cultural Institute's further plans. Duan Wenjie, the institute's director, answered, for the past decades, the main focus was the preservation led by Mr. Chang Shu Hong. Now our efforts should turn to increasing research into Dunhuang, Deng Xiaoping remarked. The foreigners have studied Dunhuang for several decades. Dunhuang is a Chinese city. Dunhuang's research belongs in China. The leader of each generation of the Dunhuang Institute all have nicknames. Chang Shu Hong has been called Dunhuang's guardian spirit. Take a picture. Mm, yeah. The, the two of us right here. Old partners. Duan Wenjie is the desert hermit. As for this demure lass from Shanghai, her nickname is the daughter of Dunhuang. Her name is Fan Jinshi. She is the current director of the Dunhuang Institute. Her underlings treat her name with great respect, as well as some trepidation. Pan Jinshi is a very complicated individual. She has uh, virtues and faults. Her work is very serious, but also have a lot of problems. That's what she's like. <laughs> People call Fan Jinshi Dunhuang's daughter not only because of the time she spent working there, but also because of the emotion she poured into her work. She once said, Our duty is to watch over this place, expand Dunhuang's culture, in order to leave this heritage of the entire world to our offspring. Her figure can be seen in the caves almost every day, the frescoes and sculptures of every cave she treats as if were her own family heirlooms. He's sitting down, concentrating on medication, and his expression is a nice one. He's smiling. It doesn't look like it, but take a closer look. I'd say it's showing on every part of his face. Where do I see it? It's a small smile, a subtle smile. He's not openly laughing. That's very exaggerated. He's smiling from his heart. See what I mean? His eye corners are creased, eyebrows a bit raised, nostrils a bit flared, and the corners of his mouth here are turned up. 46 years ago, Fan Jin Shi and three of her fellow students came to Dunhuang with Professor Su Bai of Peking University's Department of History to conduct research. The dry desert climate did not suit the Shanghai native one bit, and so Jin Shi left Dunhuang before her studies were finished. After the end of her sophomore year, Dunhuang had hunted Peking University students for its archaeology program, indicating that they wanted the students who had traveled to Dunhuang the previous year. During that time, major reinforcement and repair work was underway at the Mogao Caves. In that era of the needs of the nation being paramount, Fan Jinshi chose to travel to Dunhuang once again. Only this time she had not planned on staying there for the rest of her life. Before leaving, she made plans to reunite with her then-boyfriend Peng Jinjong at Wuhan University in three years' time. 
At the time, Jin Shi said that she'd only be staying there for three more years because conditions were terrible. It's tough over there, even though Wuhan's a big city. The three-year deadline came and went while Fun Jin Shi remained in Dunhuang. Archaeology at Dunhuang's Mogao Caves was uncharted territory, and her expertise was more and more required. In a scant few years, Fun Jin Shi and her colleagues clearly distinguished between the cave excavation techniques And I said, why don't I come to you? She said, really? And I said, why would I lie about that? In 1986, after 23 years of separation, Pan Jin Zhang reunited with Fan Jin Shi in Dunhuang. Pan Jin Zhang, who had become the associate dean of Wuhan University's history department, told his friends that he admitted defeat. Dunhuang won out. Everyone was very aware of how much sacrifice this entailed for the near 50-year-old scholar. After Pan Jin Zhang arrived in Dunhuang, he resumed his old profession, diving headfirst into archaeological surveys of the northern region of the Mogao Caves. Money! This thorough effort revealed that these few hundred squat and simple caves thought for centuries to be waste receptacles, were actually the meditation chambers and burial places of the original Buddhist monks, as well as the living areas for the craftsmen and monks that called the place their home. It seems that an archaeologist's hands would always end up brushing against history. August 15, 1983, a historic date in the history of Dunhuang studies in China. Under the directions of researchers from the Dunhuang Cultural Institute, the China Dunhuang Turpan Academic Society officially opened the National Conference on Dunhuang. Finally, after enduring, finally, after enduring for many years, Chinese scholars now had their own academic society. This signaled the rise of China's Dunhuang studies. In 1984, the Dunhuang Cultural Institute was expanded into the Dunhuang Institute, with Duan Wenjie as its director. Departments were formed to take charge of fields such as cave preservation, art research, archaeology, and manuscript studies. Following suit, the entire nation formed a batch of research and academic groups. In the following years, Chinese Dunhuang scholars set out overseas, appearing on the academic panels of nations such as France, Japan, 
Russia, and the UK. On September 20th, 1987, Dunhuang's studies finally returned to her birthplace. The International Symposium on Dunhuang Cave Research began as scholars specializing in Dunhuang from all over the world congregated in the city. During the symposium, Ji Xianlin remarked, Dunhuang is in China, but Dunhuang studies is of the world, to the thunderous applause of academics worldwide. Ji Xianlin is a famed Chinese historian and educator, well versed in subjects such as the history of Buddhism, the languages of its scriptures, history of India, and Indian studies. Dunhuang is in China, but Dunhuang studies are of the world. Academic research in subjects like chemistry and physics don't follow national boundaries. A Chinese physicist or Chinese chemist would be absurd. Academic pursuits are universal. We have an important say because we're Chinese. We know the language, the writing. Foreign scholars, no matter how smart, will never surpass their Chinese counterparts because it's not their mother tongue. This is our talent. Another advantage of ours is that we have relatively many scholars of Buddhism and Dunhuang studies. And the results of the research are open to the public for everyone. Now, 80 years later, the backbone of Dunhuang studies can said to be Chinese. From a perspective of numbers, it's very apparent. Over 90% of the world's researchers of Dunhuang manuscripts are in China. The contributions of Chinese scholars in the field increases by the day. A basic desire of the Chinese people is the repatriation of Dunhuang's artifacts. Dunhuang scholars hold this wish more fervently. Preservation, perpetuation, and cultivation of the world's cultural heritage and its artifacts requires the contributions of every person. During the 90s, Dunhuang's studies in China and the world finally entered its zenith during the 20th century. English, French, Russian, and Chinese national libraries each published their manuscript collections in China one after the other, ending the search for countless artifacts. While Dunhuang scholars in China have done their utmost to further Dunhuang academic research, the Dunhuang Institute has not neglected its role in preserving the Mogao Caves. During the 60s, the People's Republic of China spent large amounts of money to rescue the Mogao Caves from dire straits. But, as time passes, the cave's frescoes undergo constant change. The paint adorning these murals has long since faded from their original color. That picture of the Madam Governor in Cave 130 that Duan Wenjie copied is no longer there. It was visible during the 50s, albeit rather weathered. At the time, Duan Wenjie restored the painting based on other scattered paintings. Without his efforts, we would never have known that such a painting existed in the Mogao Caves. It really was all thanks to him. Above the Mogao Caves cliffs is the flat Gobi Desert, which is next to the Mingsha mountain range that runs continuously for 40 or 50 kilometers. Whenever the wind blows, the sand will fly to this flat surface and fall down along the slope of the top cliff like a waterfall. Over the course of thousands of years, the Dunhuang frescoes have experienced harsh gales of wind, sand erosion, continuous exposure to sunlight, as well as various other forms of natural destruction. She was always such a knowledgeable and well-dressed girl. However, she has aged. Due to her age, she has become more attractive and needs more attention and circumspective care. Nobody knows what the future holds for her, maybe a thousand years or just a century. That picture of the Madam Governor 
in Cave 130 that Duan Wen Jie copied is no longer there. It was visible during the 50s, albeit rather weathered. At that time, Duan Wen Jie restored the painting based on other scattered paintings as well. Without his effort, we would have never known that such a painting existed in the Mughal caves. From the beginning of the 80s, the Dunhuang Institute and the Getty Conservation Institute have cooperated in their efforts in solving the problem of the mural deterioration, applying their results towards preserving murals to great effect. We need to look at the colored ones because right here, you can see that some of the blue has become green. Ah. Crowding reinforcement and removal of salts have proven to have the greatest impact, especially in repairing open-air murals. This is currently the most advanced solution for mural restoration in the world. Of the many problems plaguing wall art, acid and base damage remains the most damaging and hardest to treat. Collaboration between the Dunhuang Institute, the Tokyo National Institute of Culture, American experts and the Getty Conservation Institute performed preservation research in Cave 53 of the Mogao Caves, discovering the root of these ailments. It seems that the usually sparse precipitation and groundwater is the source of the damages, as the salts dripping into the caves where they recrystallize, causing damage to the artwork. The solution devised by efforts was to apply climate control inside the caves whilst applying fixatives to the murals themselves. Now, more and more tourists come to Dunhuang to sightsee. What kind of impact could this increase in tourists hold for the caves? In fact, tourist flow has a big effect upon the grottos. The constant flow of traffic changes the cave's internal temperature and humidity. The large influx of water vapor and carbon dioxide in the local atmosphere causes and expands corrosion damage. This is therefore the main reasoning behind limiting the flow of tourists into the Mogao Caves. I hope that people can understand, but we need to allow a certain degree of moderation. If this were a proverbial cash cow, you don't milk it all at once. Otherwise, you won't have any left once you milk it dry. That wouldn't be good. Which is why I say this is one of our national treasures. The world only has one Mogao cave. Outside in Dunhuang and the surrounding Gansu corridor, average yearly rainfall is limited to some 30 millimeters, while water loss to evaporate exceeds 3 meters. This level of aridity is seldom matched in the entire nation. This dryness is the main reason for the long-term preservation of Dunhuang's grotto art. Facing the reality of the deterioration of the cave frescoes, how can we ensure that they are preserved forever? Because these important cultural relics won't last forever. Actually, it became quite fragile after a thousand years. We could only extend its existence through all kinds of technologies. After that, we will film it and put all of our efforts, use the best equipment to get the best quality of a picture and leave it for future generations to enjoy and appreciate. Current efforts in the preservation of cave murals are focusing on digital recording. In here, workers make precise measurements for every picture taken in order to be able to perfectly recreate the internal dimension of the overall environment. Using digital photography technology allows people to freely and dynamically record the fine details of each cave. This innovation has proven effective in decreasing the amount of tourist traffic at the site, but its overall goal remains the preservation of the wall art.
Like a great desert, the sands of time are constantly shifting. Dunhuang, a city on the northwest frontier with over two millennia of history, has experienced both rise and fall. This city, steeped in Buddhist culture, is a peaceful and comforting place. Generations of people have passed through its streets, each the subject of his own story. Dunhuang has borne witness to it all, its grottos hold their records. For these protectors of Dunhuang's grotto art, their primary motivations are their ideals. A cloud in the sky, a stray wildflower, a copse of poplars, and the frequent sandy winds their most faithful companions. After several decades, their physical features may have changed, but their will remains resolute. Their hands remain upon their paintbrushes. I've spent my entire life drawing. <laughs> my entire life. Mm, always drawing. Maybe. They are not like those ancient yogis who excavated the first caves, nor later worshipping pilgrims, but like the two groups these men and women also chose to travel far from civilization, adopting an ascetic lifestyle. The peace and happiness brought by religious devotion to culture and art is also the same. I wanted to come to these caves. My heart feels calm and the noise from the outside world has faded. I can forget about my troubles. When foreigners come to Dongguang, they're impressed. Take, for example, America. Compared to Don Huang, the U.S. has only 200 years of history. You see? Americans have to carry forward the American spirit. We Chinese have over five millennia of civilization. The Mogao caves are but a silver of that history. Our advantage is that we have countless legacies. Why don't we explore that, disseminate it, carry it forward? Guarding Dunhuang. The term guarding implies tenacity and a lack of regret. The people interred under this soil are also Dunhuang's protectors. They love Dunhuang to their dying breath. They have long melded with Dunhuang, forever inseparable with its legacy. The people inscribed upon this memorial are all so young. Their names are Li Renjiang, who came in 1964 to help, Long Ying the late wife of Dunhuang Institute's former director. Chang Shu Hong, no one in Dunhuang is unfamiliar with his name. In July of 1994, his ashes were flown to the city from far away Beijing. He lay in Dunhuang as he did in life, holding an eternal vigil. Bi He, Dou Zhang Kui, Shu An, Zhao Yushan, the list goes on. Every name representing a life that was intertwined with Dunhuang. The rain has stopped. A rainbow is formed between the cemetery and the Mogao Caves, as if the air itself is trying to say something. Across from the cemetery stands the small caves making up Mogao's northern region. These were the meditation spaces for the ancient monks, as well as the residences of those ancient artists. Those anonymous masters of their trade, after creating their immortal works, actually lived in these squat and short caves. Falling prey to sickness, injury, or age over the ages, their spirits stand watch over the world's greatest gallery of ancient artwork. January of 2008, at the National Art Museum of China in Beijing, there seems to be another Dunhuang, 
For an instant, visitors are transported into the desert by a large landscape airbrushing of the Mogao Caves. This is the starting point of Prosperity and Light, the Dunhuang artwork exhibit. In 2008, as the world's attention was focused upon Beijing, more people entered Dunhuang, entered into the long galleries of the National Art Museum, feeling that endless charm down to their very souls. This is Dunhuang's art, transcending space and time to dazzle all before its radiance.